Right. Uh, welcome to the town of Southern Shores. Uh, my name is Peter Rasco. Um, and before I introduce uh, the two presenters tonight from the Wildlife Resources Commission, the restrooms for tonight are out the door to the left and then to the right down the little hallway. which will include uh, population management and, and conflict uh, damage management as well. So that, that's kind of how everything was set up tonight. Uh, I appreciate uh, Mr. Mr. Rasco allowing us to do this tonight and for, and for setting up this venue. This, this is a great place to, uh, to, to do this presentation. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I also wanted to introduce a, a couple of other uh, Wildlife Commission employees who are here tonight who uh, I think all together we'll try to answer any questions that you have. Uh, if, if we can't answer them tonight, then we can get an answer to you. Uh, but I, I did want to introduce uh, Star Sergeant Steve Jarvis, uh, enforcement officer, uh, lives in Currituck, and uh, uh, Officer Anna Barbosa, who is the Dare County officer, uh, lives in Kill Devil Hill. So right, right here on the, uh, on the Outer Banks as well. So uh, I pre appreciate everybody being here tonight. And, uh, you know, while, while we get started, I just wanted to, to kind of get everybody in, in the frame of mind to consider what coyotes are as far as coyote bio biology, which you're going to hear about from Evan, uh, and, and to, to be able to tie that together with what management tools are available for dealing with uh, population management and for dealing with conflict management as well. So this is a good opportunity, I think, to, to try and tie it all together. Uh, we, we could talk for a long time on this topic, but I, uh, you know, everybody may have their own experiences as, as, we, as we go. So I, what I would just ask that as we, as we present the information, that, that we just have a chance to all kind of put it together. And then at the end, I'd like to, to have a chance to have some questions and uh, any discussion that we can have. So uh, with, with that being said, uh, I'll go ahead and get, we'll get Evan's presentation started and he's going to talk about coyote biology first. Good evening. So this is a tag team effort. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about biology, uh, talk with you about coyotes, how they got here, uh, what we know about them here in North Carolina and some of the biological considerations associated with, uh, with coyotes. And Chris is going to talk with you about human-coyote interactions and potential ways to address those types of interactions. Uh, 
So again, primary, primarily, I'm going to focus on three different questions with my portion of the talk. Where did they come from? A lot of people have that question. What do we know about them in North Carolina? And what are the biological considerations? Let's start with where they came from. Prior to uh, settlement by Europeans, coyotes were mostly restricted to the uh, coastal plain regions of the, of the country. Uh, after humans moved in, landscape changes occurred. Uh, people's changed. Agriculture came into play. Uh, some people were tied to uh, the development of corridors, travel corridors. Uh, as humans moved across the continent, coyotes began to change their distribution across the continent. You can see there in the early 1900s, they started to move north and west towards California, up towards uh, Alaska, also up to the northeast. And then uh, about the 1940s, 1950s, coyotes started to make a hook across the southeastern United States and started to head over in this direction. Uh, this map here shows you, just from a more regional perspective, the southeast. Uh, shows you what the coyote picture looked like in the mid-1980s. You can see those uh, states to the southwest, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama. Coyotes were in those areas at that time, but keep in mind that they were not in those areas uh, just a couple decades prior to this map being made. They were caught up in that wave of coyotes moving all across the continent. And you can see there were also sporadic populations that occurred in parts of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. Over time, of course, that population changed. This here shows you how the population changed in North Carolina. Uh, in the early 80s, we had just a few counties in the state where coyotes were documented. And in order for a county to show up on this map, it had to have at least two confirmed uh, reports of coyotes in that county. Those uh, confirmations were mostly done by pictures and by animals that were killed, either by hunters or by cars. So again, this is what the picture looked like in the early 80s. In the late 80s, we had a few more counties involved. Of course, over time, it increased in the 90s, early 90s. More and more counties uh, had coyotes in them. 96, most of the state, majority of the counties in the state had coyotes. In 2000, almost all counties, just a handful of counties, eight, nine counties or so, yet to have confirmation of coyotes. Does that mean coyotes weren't in those counties? Not at all. It just means that we didn't get the confirmation we needed in order for them to show up on this map. 2003, the last county in the state, Dare County, the last county we had to have confirmation of coyotes within the county. Again, were there coyotes in that county? More than likely, there were coyotes. Uh, we just didn't have the evidence, the documentation we needed. In 2005, we finally got that documentation. You notice on the Outer Banks, that area is still yellow. We don't show them there. They have shown up there uh, since 2005. And they're not just located to here. They're all up and down the Barrier Islands, all the way down to the, to the southern beaches, Pine Knoll Shores, Emerald Isle areas to the south of there. So not the only area that's been dealing with coyotes by far. Description of coyotes. Your typical adult coyote will average about 25 to 40 pounds in weight. A lot of people find that really hard to believe. Uh, they, you know, they relate them to the dog, uh, a lab or an animal that they, a dog that they may have. Uh, they do stand tall. A lot of times there's a lot of empty space between their belly and the ground. They have small chests. If you look at that coyote's uh, stance, very narrow stance. Again, they're going, moving through habitats. Got to be agile animals so they don't have the robustness of a lot of dogs. Uh, they're fighting to make a living every day out there on the landscape. So a lot of times they're, they're very skinny. But they have a lot of fur, which, which makes them appear to be very full animals. So average weight around 25 to 40 pounds. There are animals that exceed that. There have been animals that have been caught or taken in North Carolina that have weighed in the 60 pound range. But those are far and few between. They vary in color. They can range from light blonde uh, to the typical brown color that we see, a reddish color, and they can even be melanistic or black in color. Some of them can be almost entirely black. Life history. <clears throat> Here in the East, most typically, family, they live in family units rather than packs. So a lot of people have the perception that there's large packs of coyotes that are roaming across the landscape. That may be true to some extent in western parts of the United States, but in the eastern U.S., 
Really, you're dealing mostly with a mated pair that defend a territory in a localized area. Territories range widely in size. In some areas, it could be as small as a couple miles, depending on habitat, landscape, characteristics, food availability, those kinds of things. Uh, it averages probably five to 10 square miles in size, and it can be up to dozens of miles in size, depending again on all those various landscape level variables. <coughs> but typically, they live in family units rather than packs. So when you see coyotes, a lot of times, if it is an area that has a mated pair, you're seeing the same coyotes over and over, and then any pups that may have been born from that mated pair. They breed in February and March. They drop their pups in April or May, at April or May, and the pups disperse in late September through November. Now there may still be some pups that are on the landscape now that are in the area where they were born, but they are in the process are soon going to be dispersing. So a lot of people don't realize that you have this change up of population. You have a mated pair, they defend their territory, they're fairly successful in keeping other coyotes out of their home range. They may have some animals that move through, they scare them away, chase them off. Uh, but then you get an influx of more coyotes where the pups are born, they become very active in the late summer when they're trying to learn how to make a living, they're on the landscape with the adults. Uh, they're also highly observable, so you kind of have this peak in observations a lot of times in the late summer or early fall. And then they will disperse, and the average dispersal distance is about 30 to 50 miles. That also is variable. I'll show you some information on some long distance. But the average distance of a coyote pup when it disperses, the distance it moves is about 30 to 50 miles. So the pups that are born here or other areas most often don't hang around the area where they were born. Coyote habitat. Which of those is coyote habitat? All of those are coyote habitat. Okay, great. We've got an educated audience here. Again, originally they were in the plain states. Flat, gently rolling topography not many trees. They were probably restricted to that area because of landscape characteristics. Uh, there were predators for coyotes on the landscape at the time, wolves. Humans came in, Europeans came in and started reducing wolf populations. They started to move out of those areas and they were highly adaptable and can make a living in almost any environment. They can live in purely forested air, uh, areas. They can live in mountainous terrains. They can live in agricultural dominated environments and they can also live in environments that uh, are dominated by people, human, human environments. Uh, of course, they live in beach areas, don't they? Uh, they also live in downtown, suburban, urban areas. You may have seen articles of coyotes living in Chicago, downtown New York, those kinds of places. Why do coyotes go to those areas? They go to those areas because remember, those pups are dispersing every fall. And after some period of time, when they move into a new area, they've saturated that area and all the good habitats are taken, aren't they? So basically, they've got to take the areas that are available that aren't being defended by other coyotes, so they take up shop in unusual areas. For example, urban suburban areas. We have coyotes that actually live on islands out in the middle of the sound. Okay, so they. They basically set up shop where their space to set up shop and they are adaptable enough that they can do so. Coyote food. Coyotes eat almost anything. If it has calories, they will take advantage of it. Uh, they'll eat insects, they'll eat berries, they'll eat fruits, they'll eat small mammals, rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, possums, agricultural crops, they'll feed on dead carrion, uh, and of course, they will also feed on domesticated uh, livestock, fowl, uh, and small pets as well. Uh, what's interesting about coyotes is that they are, they're generous. They don't focus in on any one particular animal consistently. Uh, they basically take food items out of the environment at the relative abundance of, with, with, within which they exist. Okay, so if there uh, are not many rabbits on the landscape, but there are lots of squirrels, they're not going to spend a lot Focusing on rabbits, they're going to take a lot of squirrels. Spring of the year, maybe a lot of insects. Going to uh, focus on insects fall of the year, fruits, uh, <clears throat> agricultural season, you know, those kinds of things. Whatever is available in the landscape, they will generally take it out in the abundance that is within the landscape. 
Coyote dispersal. This is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about trying to manage coyotes. Again, the average dispersal distance is 30 to 50 miles, but some animals disperse less than that, some animals disperse much farther, further than that. The yellow counties at the top of the map, uh, those are, that's North Carolina, that's Central North Carolina, South, south Central North Carolina. The counties in gray, that is South Carolina. Uh, the area outlined in red with the little blue uh, lines through it, that is four A research study was done on coyotes there uh, four or five years or so ago, and they put radio transmitters on coyotes. This is the path one coyote took after the collar was placed on it when she dispersed. She left Fort Bragg, traveled south into South Carolina, made a western move. She traveled a total of 188 miles. That's straight line distance in six weeks, where she traveled hundreds of miles darting back and forth as she moved through that terrain. But the straight line distance of 188 miles took her six weeks to make that movement. Here's another animal from the same study at Fort Bragg. Uh, this animal was collared. This animal went up into the Piedmont, northern Piedmont of North Carolina, spent some time in some urban areas moved on through, went up into Virginia, and ended up kind of close to Washington, D.C. This animal made a move of 220 miles straight line distance uh, whenever she dispersed. So kind of keep that in mind again when people talk about eradicating uh, coyotes, so let's get them all out of here. There are coyotes on the landscape all over that are just looking to take the place of the coyotes that are that will move here and elsewhere. Coyotes that think that Fills their place could come from Raleigh, it could come from Greenville, Fayetteville, who knows where it might potentially come from. The last thing is the adaptability of coyotes to mortality. Basically, there are three things generally that take the coyotes out. One is vehicles, two is disease. We don't have a tremendous amount of disease issues in our, in our state, but there are some disease processes that occur in coyotes. And lastly, harvest, which of course occurs mostly in rural areas. And by harvest, we mean they're taken by hunters with a gun or they're trapped. But what's interesting about coyotes is that they adapt to various levels of mortality. If you have low mortality, which is probably a situation like what you have going on here, uh, you have low mortality, generally you have a robust coyote population. When you have a lot of coyotes on the landscape, you have increased competition. You have a lot of mouths to feed. There's less food on the landscape to go around. Because there's less resources, you have decreased body condition, reduced litter size, uh, decreased pup survival rates, and you also have a decrease in the number of yearling, uh, yearlings that can't breed in the first breeding season. If you flip that around and increase mortality, Again, the, the primary method of mortality is, is through harvest, whether by taking with a firearm or by trapping. But if you increase that mortality, then you have decreased competition because you have fewer mouths on the landscape to feed, don't you? So you've got increased food conditions, increased body conditions, just the reverse of the other scenario. You have increase in litter sizes. Rather than putting out maybe three or four pups, maybe you're going to put out eight or nine pups. Increased pup survival rates, and you also potentially have uh, more yearly pups that are breeding within the first the breeding cycle that they, that they go through. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that you have this interesting dynamic that occurs with coyotes as you introduce various levels of mortality. Okay. I guess that's all I have for biology, so. Very good. Th thank you, Evan. How, how many? How many just heard something about coyotes that they had not heard before? I, when when you look at the species, you're you're looking at a, at a survivor. 
Uh, they they uh, can use a really large area. And one of the things that, that I, I think really always astounds me is when you look at dispersal, you're, you're looking at, at uh, what, what happened on Fort Bragg is happening across the board at this point. Uh, and then you also look at transient coyotes, coyotes that never do establish a, a territory, they're constantly on the move, looking for that opportunity that Evan talked about for an area to open up and then they, they pair up and, and uh, do what coyotes do. So I, uh, very, very interesting when you look, at, you look at what coyotes can do. And then you look at a very unique situation, I think, that we have here uh, on the Outer Banks. Uh, some, the land here, of course, is, is very different than, uh, than, than what you see you know, on mainland uh, coastal North Carolina and further west uh, in, into the Piedmont Mountains. So we have a, we have a unique uh, place as far as uh, the, the potential for coyotes to be seen and for the, the potential for coyotes to, uh, to, to be discussed and talked about a lot because we've, we've got uh, the highest uh, urban development, the densest human development here on the Outer Banks. And I think what makes it interesting for me uh, as a district biologist is that it's, it's really seasonal. Uh, the human population, it changes here, doesn't it? A big time. I mean, it's just amazing. What a, what a great time for us to, to give this talk because I, I think generally what we, what we would see in this room as far as uh, the number of people that are interested would probably be diminished in the summertime because most of the people that, I've, that I have a chance to talk to typically are not residents of, of the Outer Banks. Uh, they may be visiting for a short period of time. Uh, but, but it all kind of works together uh, when, when we talk about interactions of coyotes and people. So I, I want to, to, to kind of springboard off of the talk about biology and to put what we're going to talk about it as far as interactions of coyotes and people uh, and coyotes and other wildlife species, to put that in the context of, of uh, how, coyotes, how coyotes are as a species and then to tie it into the Outer Banks uh, to be as specific as we can be. So I, I think, uh, I, based on what we just heard, you know, it's, it's pretty clear coyotes are, are predators, but they're also omnivores. Uh, they, they're generalist species. They can use almost any food source uh, to their benefit. One of the, one of the things that I think we're, we're maybe seeing uh, where we have coyotes now established is we, we get a lot of uh, discussion about what impacts they're having on our wildlife species. And I, I think it's safe, it's safe to say that they, they certainly on an annual basis affect uh, wildlife populations of certain species, primarily small, small mammals uh, is, is where we would see, see uh, some, some impacts annually. Uh, I think one interesting one there, the red fox, is, is one species that, that can be negatively affected by, by coyote populations uh, because they, they compete directly uh, for the same places and same resources. But you know, when, when we look at, at the, the, the potential impacts of coyotes on some, some of our uh, native wildlife species, I, I think we have to acknowledge that it's not just a negative uh, impact as well. Uh, when we affect small mammal populations, we also benefit some additional populations as well, particularly ground nesting birds. Uh, they, they've actually shown that when you, when you affect small mammal populations, particularly raccoons and skunks and other, other small mammals that coyotes can eat, uh, what you may see is actually the increase of some other populations uh, that, that are impacted as, by nest predators like possums and raccoons and, and skunks. So they, they, they certainly are playing an ecological role, uh, but, but the reason we're here tonight, I, I think, is because of uh, the, the potential for human inter interactions. You know, when we look at, at coyote populations, uh, we, we generally look at, at these, three, these three potential issues that, that come up in a discussion, uh, including disease, human safety, and property damage. Uh, I'll just say when, when we look at, at uh, the potential of a species to, to carry rabies or transmit rabies, uh, I, I get some concerns about that that, that come to me. But I think it's, it's uh, very clearly been shown, uh, at least in this state, that the, the number of, of coyotes with rabies that have been tested in the last 25 years is very, very small uh, compared to many other species, uh, particularly uh, foxes and skunks and uh, raccoons 
you know, which we, we get, get a lot of here on the beach as well. Uh, I, I think it's, it's safe to say that when, when we start to understand coyotes and their biology, I think we start to, to understand uh, the species a little bit better because that, that's very important because typically what, what, what I hear uh, is, is driven by the unknown. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I have people that might call me that have questions about something that they're seeing or something that they, they has heard has happened. And uh, I think that, that, that really, really kind of shows up in, in any discussion about coyotes. Uh, typically, when people see a coyote, they want it gone. I think it's been true across the board where we've had coyotes historically as well. You know, big efforts have been made out west for, for many, many decades uh, to push coyotes down to, to almost nothing because of livestock issues, but still got coyotes. Uh, you know, fears of, of threats to people uh, and, and basically fears about numbers of coyotes. You know, how many do we actually have? It, it's hard to say. Uh, I, I will say that just seeing a coyote is not necessarily a problem. You know, you, I'm sure some of you probably have seen coyotes. Some of you may not have seen coyotes. But just seeing them is, is uh, at this point, now that we know we got them, may or may not be an issue. Uh, typically, that, that's, not, that's not a problem. The problems that we hear come from uh, discussions about property damage or potential impacts to, uh, to people and pets, typically. So I, I, think, I think in the end, it, it's important to, to understand that, that most, most of the conflicts that, that we actually would deal with uh, hinge on unsecured foods. Uh, they, they hinge on habituated animals that have been fed repeatedly and can actually lose their fear of people or are not afraid to be around people, which is, which is not hard to uh, have happen, particularly in urban areas. Uh, I think it, it's, it's very important when we look around, around us at, at our uh, property, it's important to, to acknowledge that coyotes can eat almost anything. When, when we start to look at food sources that are available, that would be a first step uh, to, to understanding what we can do to try and prevent issues from occurring uh, on, our, on our own property. Uh, I think one thing that always comes up is uh, free feeding of wildlife. Uh, particularly in residential areas, that that is something that that uh, should be discouraged. Uh, prior to receiving coyote calls from from the outer banks, from the from the beach areas, uh, I've I've always, ever since I've been in this this district, have always received a lot of uh, calls about foxes and raccoons and possums. You know, that, those are very common species here, uh, very common species many places. But it's always been a food issue. When, when you have them in, in one place repeatedly, it's because they're drawn there by easy food. Uh, so we, we always, always have to, to keep, keep that in mind and uh, do what we can to prevent free feeding because when we freely feed wildlife, we feed everything. You know, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's the root of a lot of the issues that we get, particularly seeing coyotes and other uh, critters in the same places over and over and over again as they relate to our residential areas. Uh, fortunately, attacks are very rare. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, unprovoked uh, attacks or bites on, on people in this state, uh, you know, since, since we've had coyotes. Uh, certainly, if you corner something up or, or you, you put your hands on it, you, you can have a problem with almost anything. But uh, fortunately, they don't want to be around people unless we provide the things that uh, are attractive to them. Uh, so that being said, when we, we look at the, the big picture of, of what, what we can do to, to uh, number one, prevent what we can prevent, which is, is very difficult to prevent everything, but uh, I think when we look at all the tools in the toolbox, as, as I would call it, I think we, we see that there are some things we can do over time uh, that, that help the situation and uh, all the way down to managing a, a population. Uh, over time as well on an annual basis. So I, I'll, I'll just say we, we got coyotes and now, you know, I think the question, what do we do with them, uh, always tends to come up. So managing is, is very important of, of, uh, of all of our wildlife uh, species, but we, we have to tie everything together, not just, uh, not just the conflicts, but the, the population management uh, that has to take place on an annual basis. 
Uh, I think it's important to know that population management is different than, than damage management. But, but they can be related because certainly when we manage the population, we can take individual animals that uh, potentially have, have caused issues or, or may cause issues. So I, I think that's a, a, a good way to, to kind of go about things. Uh, we've already had it mentioned that uh, eradication is, is not an option. Uh, I have that come to me quite a bit that a lot of people say we don't want any of them. Well, I, I, I think that, that would probably be true as far as what the desire would be, but uh, I think it, it's uh, very important to, to go ahead and acknowledge that we're not going to eradicate the, the coyote population uh, here, here on the Outer Banks or within the state as well. Uh, one, of the, one of the big issues when you look at dispersal distances, which are really mind-blowing, uh, and you look at transient animals that are constantly on the move, uh, that, that show up here and then they're gone again, you know, show up somewhere else. Uh, it, it makes it very difficult to, to pin anything down. Uh, we, we actually have to uh, contribute to 70% mortality of the standing population annually in, in order to, to push coyotes down. Uh, and that, that's on an annual basis. That's, that's an extremely high harvest. And we've, we've talked about why because they can compensate for, for that loss by increasing reproduction and increasing uh, their, their condition and, and health. So it's, uh, it is, it's very, I think, very important to, to be, uh, you know, be real about it uh, when, when you look at, at the, the biology of coyotes and tie it all together, it comes down to annual management. Uh, mo most of the phone calls that I get, I, I think we would probably uh, kind of lump them this way most of the calls I get uh, tend to come from complaints about the presence of coyotes. You know, that, that's a general uh, catch-all complaint that says, we got them, we don't want them. And I, I, under, I certainly understand that. I think then it comes back down primarily to, uh, to pet safety because things do happen, I know. I know they do. We know what coyotes can do and what they, w what they will do when they have an opportunity uh, to, to take a small mammal, including small pets, we know that's true. Uh, concerns for human safety, you know, I, I think any time you, you see an aggressive posture of a coyote towards a pet, which, which happens between uh, canids, between a coyote and, an, and another dog, uh, you, you, can, you can actually witness that uh, firsthand uh, sometimes. I think that's uh, uh, unsettling to say the least. Uh, and then nuisance type animals, nuisance type behaviors, all the way up to damage type situations, uh, including uh, denning underneath buildings or sheds, uh, denning underneath structures, uh, where you, you get, uh, get pups that are being raised underneath somebody's barn or somebody's shed. Yeah, those, those type of situations uh, also come up as well. I think the first thing that we have to do when, when we, we see an issue around us or we're experiencing an issue is, is we have to really define what the, the actual problem is. And I think that the first question that we should always ask is, why is he here? Why, why am I seeing this coyote? You may only see it once, and if so, it's because they're constantly on the move. Uh, if you see it repeatedly in the same place, I think usually, uh, typically, food ten tends to be the issue. An easy food source uh, can be attractive to them, and they can they can use one place for for quite a while. Uh, food sources are in, including uh, pet food. You know, I always try to recommend to people that if you got to feed outside, don't feed any more than your animal will eat at a, at a time. Uh, feeding inside is even better. Uh, trash and food scraps. You know, I've I've looked at some situations where. It, and it's easy to do where you, you go out and clean the pot out behind the house and uh, you, get, you get foxes and raccoons and, and possums and other critters coming and eating free food uh, from table scraps. Uh, bird feeders, you know, I, I think this is, a, this is a great picture of a coyote about to spill it on the ground where he can eat it. You know, as Evan said, if it's got calories, it's, it's food. Uh, fruit trees, if you, got, if you got trees bearing fruit, particularly in the fall, that would be a, a good uh, opportunity to have a coyote or, or other wildlife that comes and utilizes the fallen fruit. Uh, I think the, basically the, the way you deal with that is, is to try and pick fruit up, which it, it, that's work, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not easy. 
not easy to handle. Uh, then I, I think the other part of it is when we look at our, our pets, uh, really uh, becomes a, a, an important thing to, to consider. If, if we see a coyote anywhere, you know, or more than once, I, I always kind of consider that as, as a good opportunity to talk to my neighbors, to say, you know what, I saw a coyote down the street the other day, this will be a good time to make sure everything's secure, to make sure we don't leave uh, pets out overnight, uh, in particular in unfenced yards. Uh, sometimes you may see a coyote repeatedly just, just because he, he's there. Uh, if you've got brushy areas, you know, in your yard or wood piles or anything like that, uh, you, you certainly wind up with coyotes that are eating natural foods, wild foods, uh, hunting around an edge, like a, the edge of a yard or, or that kind of place. Uh, basically doing what coyotes do, but they were doing it repeatedly around your yard or in your subdivision. Uh, you know, same, same way with, with uh, when we talk about small mammals, that, that includes cats. You know, very, very clearly, they, they, uh, they, they consider that food. So we, we have to be mindful. Uh, when we, we look at, at the tools that are available, there are some things that we can do. Uh, basically, non-lethal tools is where we always begin. We always start with education, which is, which is what I, I think we're, we're having a good uh, opportunity to do that tonight to kind of get everybody on the, on the same page as far as understanding what, what uh, coyotes are and what's an issue and what may not be an issue and how to prevent it. Uh, I, I think it's always important that we work together, particularly in residential areas. Uh, I work places that have very few people, you know, counties that have very low human density, and generally they may not have a neighbor anywhere close, but what, what we see here is a very very close knit a residential subdivisions and uh, in other areas that I, I think it, it really pays to work together uh, to reduce uh, reduce the potential for, for issues. Uh, when we we talk about uh, animal husbandry, a lot of the the calls that I might get in other counties may may hinge more on poultry or livestock uh, and the potential for coyotes to damage those uh, those animals. Uh, that, that's typically not, not what I, I get here. You know, I think we just have to, have to kind of be mindful of how we, uh, how we treat, treat our animals in, in our yards and in our subdivisions. Uh, you know, we, we, we look at non-lethal tools as preventative measures. You know, good non-lethal tools uh, work, work day after day after day. Uh, then we, we're going to get down into some of the lethal tools. Uh, which, which basically we're, we're looking at population management uh, through hunting and trapping and managing damage situations poti potentially through uh, a d issue of depredation permits uh, where we have damage. So I, I think the, the key in the end is to understand what's available and then to match it with the problem. Because some, some problems take one solution, some problems take an take a entirely different solution. Uh, Non-lethal tools, uh, again, education, that, that's a page off of our website at ncwildlife.org. It is a great resource for, uh, for, for almost any information about many, many species, uh, especially coyotes. Uh, you see there, there's a tab that says have a wildlife problem. Has anybody been on our website and, and received information or contact with the Wildlife Commission that way? So we, we, we've had a few. Uh, that, that's a great way to, to find my phone number, which I'm going to give you again in a few minutes. But uh, the, the information is there to, to kind of keep refreshed on, this, uh, on, on how to manage these issues. Uh, one, one of the things I, I think that this is important to remember is that particularly in residential areas, when we have structures or sheds that uh, may have open spaces underneath, I think one of, the, one of the, the key things to remember is that if we keep that closed up, keep the under space closed, uh, it, it really helps to not have some, some other issues, not just coyotes, but uh, other critters as well that will live underneath buildings and, and sheds. Uh, fencing, I think, is, is a very important. You know, some places fencing can be used easily. Uh, some places fencing may not be allowed. But generally, if there are no attractants, if we've dealt with food sources and other attractants, I, I think I see fencing as, as one option that stops the easy movement of, uh, of coyotes ac across areas. 
you know, they, unless there's something to draw them there or to push them there, uh, I, I think you, you may actually get some benefit uh, from that as well to, to reduce some of the issues. Uh, some, of, some of the lethal techniques that comes down, I think, comes down to annual population management. And again, it's, it's important to acknowledge that, that you're, you're not eradicating coyotes, uh, you're, you're looking at annually managing numbers uh, the best way that we can. Uh, you, some individual uh, problem coyotes will be removed that way uh, through, through hunting and trapping. But it also uh, keeps, keeps things kind of stirred up where they're not so attracted to people, I think is, is one way of looking at it as well. Uh, coyote hunting, basically in, in 95 of the 100 counties in this state, uh, the, the rules, rules are, are uh, very straightforward. Uh, you know, there's no bag limit, meaning there's no annual bag limit for coyotes in, uh, in, the, in the whole state. Uh, certain things are allowed. But you, you have to keep in mind that uh, Dare County does have a special set of coyote rules uh, that, that govern hunting in this county. Uh, that, that's a lot to read, and we can talk more about it. All this information is available on our website. But uh, starting in 2015, there are five counties in the state, including Dare, uh, that, that were uh, originally Red Wolf reintroduction counties that actually have a, a special set of hunting rules that would mean that coyote hunting in these counties uh, requires a special coyote hunting permit. It's a free permit online in addition to a hunting license. Uh, there's no night hunting of coyotes in, in these five counties. Uh, there's also mandatory reporting of any coyotes that are, are taken for any reason uh, in, in these counties, including Dare. Uh, so I, I guess the, the other part of it, when we talk about depredation permits, uh, only Wildlife Commission uh, staff can issue depredation permits concerning coyote damage. So that, that's, a, that's a little bit different in, in these five counties as well. Uh, I, I put this up because I think it's a really good, uh, really good example of, not, of, number one, the growth of the coyote population uh, as it's mirrored by the harvest, uh, starting in 2002 all the way to 2015. But what I want you to see is that the left side the green bars are the hunter harvest. That, the highest number is 40,000 statewide. This is statewide. The right-hand side is harvest by trapping. That is the line that you see. So what, what we see is that statewide, there, there are more coyotes taken by hunting than, than by trapping. The reason for that is because we got a lot more hunters than we do trappers. Uh, and they, a lot of coyotes are taken incidental to, to other types of hunting. So that, that's kind of how it plays out when you're talking about numbers. But the, the other part of this is that when it comes down to uh, the success, as far as the number of animals that are removed by individual hunters and trappers, uh, the number removed by trappers is a higher number uh, removed per trapper. So that, that's, that's important to remember as well because I think what we'll see is that uh, hunting and trapping may or may not be feasible everywhere. Uh, depending on where, where we're talking about. So I, I think uh, one, one of the, the big challenges on the Outer Banks regarding hunting is that uh, urban development uh, has resulted in, in small parcel sizes and dense human development. Uh, the, the picture on the right shows all the parcels on the GIS site. Uh, very difficult, you know, most, I would assume most of those are, are considerably less than one acre in size with some larger tracts thrown in. Uh, where, where is hunting feasible in a setting like that? Uh, you know, where, where is it effective is, is the other part of it. I think, I think the thing to always remember when it comes down to hunting is it may or may not be applicable everywhere uh, simply because local ordinances in a setting such as suburban type settings or urban type settings uh, are for a special reason and they prevail. So when it, when it comes down to, uh, to, to actually using a firearm safety first. Uh, trapping regulations, I'm, I'm glad we're having this talk tonight because last Friday on December 1st, our trapping season came in uh, for, for the east, eastern part of the state. All the green counties, uh, legal, legal trapping season came in on, on uh, last Friday and goes out the end of February. So there, that is certainly an option for managing populations. Again, 
how well it, it can be used or how effective it is depends on where you are. Uh, there are certainly regulations involving uh, uh, our trapping by licensed trappers. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that there's a trapping license required. It's recreational trapping. Uh, basically, weather-resistant tags had to be put on traps. There, there's, there's all kinds of regulations that, that a trapper has to be familiar with in order to, uh, to, to be able to do, do uh, what they do legally uh, in this state. I think one of the, the biggest parts of it is is that it's a commitment. Uh, trapping is certainly a commitment because they got to be checked uh, got to be checked daily. Uh, you know, anytime we talk about trapping, there's lots of opinions. Uh, some of it's founded uh, in in things in the past. Some of it's you know I think uh, probably more acceptable now than than ever in a lot of places. But I think it's it's important to remember that you can go on our website and actually see what trapping entails. Uh, as far as removing individuals uh, using traps. Best management practices, BMPs, uh, have been developed over, over many, many years uh, to, to make trapping as effective and uh, humane as, as it can be uh, as far as uh, using it as a population management tool uh, statewide. So one, one thing I guess to, to keep in mind as well, in, in some counties, uh, coyote trapping may be, may certainly be legal and, and uh, easier to do. Uh, some counties do not uh, allow fox trapping. So Dare County is, is one county that does not have a, a fox trapping season. So trappers that, that trap uh, for coyotes, if they catch a fox, he, he's released uh, by, by law. So th there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of things to, to put into place to, uh, to understand all the regulations when it comes down to, uh, to, to being effective and uh, lawful as a, as a trapper, but it's a, it's a great management tool uh, when it comes down to managing populations of fur bearers. Uh, again, trapping challenges, uh, you know, hundreds of small parcels, I'm gonna say thousands of small parcels. <laughs> when you, you look, at the whole, look at the whole county, there's, there's a lot that goes on on the outer banks. Uh, it's all interspersed with habitat, you know, where, where we certainly got coyotes uh, across, across most places. Uh, they're passing through. Uh, you know, I think you have to ask yourself the question, where is trapping feasible? You know, you, you certainly don't want, you want to minimize the chance of catching non-target animals, and we, we had that discussion a while ago about where trapping may be feasible and where it may not be. Uh, any local ordinances that uh, don't allow trapping in certain ways or certain places, that's always something that, that has to be sorted out uh, before, before any of that work is done. Uh, and I think the other part is trapper incentive. It may, it may be just fine to trap. It may be hard to find somebody who is willing to trap or able to trap. So that, that's, uh, that's some limitations I think that we see. Uh, the, the, we've talked about uh, basically hunting and trapping during a regulated season frameworks. Uh, sometimes there are actually problems, damage type situations that necessitate uh, permits for trapping outside of the hunting season or trapping season. Uh, typically those, those permits are, are centered around property damage. So if, if somebody has a loss of livestock or poultry and they, they make a, a contact about that with me, uh, then we will do a site investigation and, and decide what options are available as far as uh, potential depredation permits. Second parties can be written on a permit uh, who can actually do the work on the, the person who signs the permit's behalf. Uh, I think it, it's, it's important to, to remember as well that permits can only be issued to a property owner experiencing damage uh, or, or have other situations that, that could be discussed as far as necessitating that type of activity. Uh, in these, this uh, five county area, depredation permits can only be issued by Wildlife Commission staff, uh, include myself or, or uh, Wildlife Enforcement. And it, when, when we tie it all together, basically there's a mandatory reporting of any coyotes that are taken under a permit. And I always have to answer the question, well, can we just take them somewhere else? Can we, can we just you know, remove them from this property and go put them somewhere else, maybe somebody else wants them. And that, that is, that's, that's not an option. Uh, any, any animals in, in the order carnivora 
uh, including coyotes, uh, are either euthanized uh, when trapped under a permit or released at, at the site that they're, that they're captured. So that, that's always a, a, a thing to consider uh, when it comes down to, to that type of work. Uh, same, same way in this five county area, I, I think it, it, it is important to, to keep in mind that any uh, trapping that goes on if an animal is captured that you're not sure about or is radio marked, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service would be a good contact to make uh, for identification prior to doing anything with that animal. Uh, so that, that's just something to keep in mind as well. Uh, I think in, in summary, when, when we look at, at the tools that are available that we've discussed, uh, I think, I think we, we always look at, at hunting as having uh, some opportunity in, in certain places, but maybe not everywhere. I, I think a lot of the places on the outer banks, uh, probably opportunities are very, very small or non-existent in a, in a lot of places. Uh, you, you should always ask uh, local authorities about local ordinances uh, before, before you, you pursue uh, anything regarding uh, a, a firearm or, or hunting or trapping uh, in those places. Uh, and keep in mind that there are special rules in Dare County that we've discussed. Uh, regulated trapping, as, as a summary, I, I think there's potential uh, through trapping, depending on where you are and what, what part of the Outer Banks you're talking about, uh, there's potential to, to remove some individual coyotes that way. Uh, but there are challenges associated with urban development and small parcel sizes uh, because there, there has to be uh, landowner permission, written permission, in order to, to trap. So I, I think what, one of the discussions that we, we might have uh, is, you know, how, how might it work, de depending on where the interest is, you know, what, what would be necessary in order to uh, implement uh, annual trapping by recreational trappers. Uh, we actually maintain a list of, uh, of licensed trappers uh, on our website who, who have said in different counties that they'd be interested in trapping. Uh, that, that information is, is available. Uh, I, I made a note there that, you know, we're not the only ones that uh, experience some coyote issues. And uh, if, if you want to take a look at, at Emerald Isles, uh, website, I think you'll see that they've, they've had some of the same concerns and issues over time. And they've, they've really looked at some, I think, some creative ways at, uh, at trying to, to help uh, put people together on the same page uh, that, that they would uh, be able to, to take some action that would be helpful to uh, private property owners. So that, that's just something to, to kind of keep in mind. We're not the only ones. Uh, depredation permits, they can be issued. Uh, but they're only issued to the owner of the property where damage is occurring. Uh, we, we would always be the contact there in this county as far as coyote permits go. So I'll, I'm going to have my information out there uh, for, for you if, if you have, have the need to have that discussion uh, due to damage or other issues that come up. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of summarize it right here. You know, I think what, what we've talked about tonight is uh, the, the big picture when it comes to coyotes. Uh, you know they're they're here to stay. You know they're they're not they're not going to go away, and, and we can uh, we can't make them go away. So I, you know on that end, just seeing coyotes is is not necessarily a problem. I think seeing coyotes opens the door to make sure everybody uh, remains remains aware of uh, of how they can prevent issues on on their own property or uh, in homeowners associations, you know, as, as residential subdivisions. Uh, I think it's important to share awareness, you know, to, to, to kind of constantly be in the discussion uh, about how, how these things work and to, to keep everybody understanding how, they, how we, you can work together because prevention is the key uh, in the end. Day, day by day, we can't, we can't stop everything from happening, but I believe we have a, a big effect over time uh, as far as the, the issues that don't occur when we do, do things together and do it well. Uh, problems do arise, but I, I think when we assess the situation, we, we also ask ourselves, well, which tools may apply? And on that end, uh, you, you can call me anytime. If, if you have things that come up or you have concerns, I am more than glad to discuss it with you. And if it comes down to a situation that we need to look at together, as far as determining what the best course of action is, uh, I'm more than glad to do that. So I've, I've talked to some of you in this room because I, I know uh, over the last several months we, we've had, had, uh, had some discussions. So 
uh, you know, please continue to let me know as you have things come up, and I'm more than glad to, to help work, uh, work things in a direction that'll be helpful for you. Uh, on that end, this is my, that's my phone number. I gave you a little tiny pencil, so you can, you can write it down, it, it, however you want to do it. I've also got some cards up here I'm gonna give you as well. Uh, there's also some, some landowner assistance on our website. I'm going to, we're gonna pass some sheets out to you that I think will kind of be a, a little bit of a, a clearinghouse for information uh, regarding uh, issues that come up in, in some of the conflict uh, solutions. Uh, then all of our regulations, including our trapping regulations, are on our website as well. So I'm, we're going to pass that information out to you uh, b before you leave tonight. So uh, with, with that being said, uh, we have been asked if you have any questions or, or uh, things that, that you'd like to bring up, if you would please step up to the microphone so that we can, this will be part of what's recorded. So we'll, we'll start with that. And, uh, okay. Yes. When, when you see a coyote? Yeah, when they are in the driveway, but you have to walk by to get to your house. What do you do? What should your reaction be? And, and along with that question, one coyote, okay? How about uh, three coyotes? Well, the, the question was, what do, you, what do you do when you're walking your dog and, and you see not one coyote, but three coyotes? I, I think the, the, the question is, where are you at? Because you, you just, you never know when these, these things will occur. Most of the time, I would think these would occur off of, off of your own property. Have you tried to run the coyote off? Or are they aggressive towards your pet? No, I actually go in and, and walking my dog and hoping that they get I would I would let I would let the coyote know who I am as far as I'm a person, and I would keep my dog very close to me, and walk the other way. I would not continue into something that I was concerned about, because certainly coyotes and, and dogs have a, a relationship where they can show aggression towards a dog, not because of you, but because it's another dog. I, I think some some of those uh, issues that come up. The, the, best, the best course of action is to, to keep your eyes out. When you see a situation like that, you try to walk away from it. I would not turn my back and walk away. I, I, would, I would skirt around and try to go back where I came from in a situation like that and let somebody know if it, happens, if it only happens once and there's no aggression, I would let people know that, that, that it occurred. If it happens repeatedly, then that would certainly be something that I would like to hear about. Yes, I, I, would, I would definitely let them know that, uh, that they don't want to be around, they don't want to be around a person, but they, they can overcome the fear of people because they're, they're intent on, a, on another dog, on another canid. So that, I, I think everybody kind of has to figure out the best, the best way of dealing with it based on the situation. I've seen some situations where there was aggression towards a dog on a leash. And I, I think you, you have to deal with that the best you can. I would not put myself in, in harm's way, you know, certainly, because they, they may not even look at you. They may be, be after uh, what you got on the leash. 
and ignore you. But I, I, I would certainly try to drive my best to let everybody know and to be loud about it as far as trying to run, run the coyote off. Uh, as wild animals, they don't want to be around people, but sometimes they become very fixed on what, what, they're, uh, you know, what they're trying to do. So. Yeah, you. You you'll get that that type of uh, appearance as far as aggression towards the dog snarling. Uh, I mean, I, depending on how big the dog is, you know, they they may look at the dog as food. They may look at the dog as just a, a territorial uh, reaction. Particularly with denning coyotes, you know, when you get into the the summertime, you have young young coyotes in a den. I think we we've certainly heard of situations. Uh, that, that probably resulted from a, a, a den nearby where they were actually being protective. Uh huh. Yes. Yes, please. My name is Gail Kowalski, and I'm in Nags Head. And I have some very strong personal feelings and experiences with some of these coyotes. Um, not without going into too much detail, I've lost five cats. And they're not outdoor cats by my choice. You know, we were in the process of trapping, neutering, trying to tame them. And the only good thing is the death is quick. They're killing machines. They're efficient. They don't play with their food. But they do leave chunks behind <laughs> that are not desirable to them. So we've been able to ascertain what was killed. I very strongly feel Dare County geographically, because of our, in essence, being surrounded by water, for two, two things, we have, I feel, a strong explosion of coyotes now. It didn't ever used to, I mean, I've been here 40 years. This never used to be an issue. And now it's a big issue. So our geographic isolation allows them to proliferate and kind of stay here. Um, they're not wandering back to Raleigh so much from here because we've got the water, it's geographically more isolated. And there's a lot of ready food source. There's a lot of small pets down here, and I have had countless conversations with people that I've known and not known that have lost dogs and other pets. The, also, the, the geographic nature of our area, I think, allows a unique opportunity you say eradication is not possible, and that is probably true. But I think our area allows a very strong attempt at eradication. The more you can take out permanently, I don't think we're going to get that flood that in that exchange you know, influx um, because of our surrounding water. Um, I think we stand a chance of eradicating. I personally would like to see no coyotes in Dare County. They're not native here. They have no natural predators in any quantity here, except people, cars, the occasional bear. <laughs> um, and I think somehow the state and local governments should work together to initiate a program of attempted eradication, because I think a huge dent can be made to knock this situation back to where it's not a constant topic of conversation, that it can be much more occasional. I've got about 20 um, certain type of coyote traps back at my, my shop, and I can't use them, you know. Um, you, you can't use them? Um, I have a friend who knows exactly how to use them, and, and my property there's the grass and it's not wooded. Right next to me I have um, a patch of woods that are where the coyote, it's a coyote dining room in our area. 
and the fellow that owns the property, um, I'm going to make an attempt to contact him, but he's, he's not in the state. You know, he's somewhere in Virginia to see if I can get permission to, to set the traps. But I, I think that there are places down here where traps can work, traps can be set, some hunting can happen. And I, I, I really feel there should be a very strong attempt at eradication of, of, of this animal. It truly, to me, from what I've learned, it's only a matter of time before there is going to be here, uniquely here, a human, an attack on a, a human person by a coyote or perhaps a couple of them. Because if we think the population is exploded now, which it is, because now it's a <clears throat> constant thing, you always see them, you hear about them, they're evident, they're on everybody's mind, they're in the newspaper, on the TV. Well, think about this spring, when all these coyotes that are not traveling off to Raleigh or places west are having their little coyote babies. And it, it, I can just see this just keeping growing. Um, I was sitting next to a lady who she doesn't currently have a pet because they show up in her backyard. She's like, do I want, I would like to have a pet, but she has to really think about that because you can't just do what you normally do, let your pet out. And I don't know if this is a possibility um, or if there's a committee or I, I would be involved um, to look at what it would take to try for eradication of coyotes down here. We may not achieve total eradication, but I think we could really make a dent in the population, knock it back to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Is that possible? Is eradication possible? No, <clears throat> what I just said. A strong attempt at eradicating, that being the goal, knowing you can't quite reach that, but yet you can knock those populations back 20, 30 years with a strong coordinated attempt between the state and county and town governments. Is that possible? Or is that type of cooperation impossible? I guess, I guess my question would be what, what is going on now that would be similar to what you're talking about as far as uh, annual trapping or any hunting effort that is possible or feasible? I, I think the, the challenges are, you know, we, we've tried to, to discuss that as far as the challenges of this place. And, I, you know, any, any trapping that's going on now, you know, as far as regulated uh, trapping effort, I think would be a good place to begin to see what, uh, what, what you can do on your property. Because the, the question is where, where you have access to do that type of, uh, that type of activity and where you don't have access. Yeah, I think that's, that's the challenges that mm -hmm. we've, uh, you're trying to highlight tonight is that small parcels, I don't know how many acres you own, but that, that basically you're, you're relegated to your acreage as far mm -hmm. as where you can get permission or where you, you can do any type of work that way with outside of written permission from other people. I mean, is it so in... It's a, it's a challenge that way. Is it in the wildlife management's oh, pr prerogatives to... Um, attempt to act for the Wildlife Commission to actually do the work for well it. To, to work with whoever would be interested to, to work at getting rid of these critters um, knowing we can't do 100% but good lord if we could eliminate a whole lot of them it yeah. would improve things a heck of a lot for everybody the, the, the tools that we've discussed tonight are, are they're already there you know, I don't know that, that it's all being utilized as, as it can be now, but the, the toolbox remains the same, I believe, when it comes down to what you're what you're Well, the tools, exactly what we've the tools are started. there that you've said, yes. but having a coordinated, concentrated effort to mobilize the tools, that, that the lethal tools especially. The, uh, <clears throat> the, 
the most communities you know that we that I have experience with, if it's a community driven approach, that's going to be your your best bet or best mm -hmm. bang for the buck. Uh, we have just just Chris for the northeastern district district one. It's our agency doesn't really have the resources to handle that task on its own, but we we're definitely here uh, willing to coordinate, assist town managers, assist citizens to help drive some kind of community based resolution. But that ultimately, that's really what it would take is is some grassroots level community based effort to try to organize and come up with a consensus on how they would like that the re, the, any type of management to occur. You're dealing with lots of individual landowners, mm -hmm. many small property sizes. You've got uh, issues associated with local laws and restrictions. Uh, you've got different opinions among the residents in the community. It, really, the most success generally is garnered by those communities that come together and come up with a consensus approach. And mm -hmm. obviously, as an agency, you know, we're here every step of the way to provide technical guidance and the resources that we can from our perspective. But really, it's, it's, we don't have the ability to come in and take over and implement mm -hmm. certain management actions, but we definitely are here to help provide guidance to uh, knowing the help level put together a program. Of the, the population level at this time, it, it's only going to get worse. Well, I will say that you saw in the presentation how coyotes have moved eastward and actually northward and westward just throughout the entire continent. And they do, whenever they, you get a made a pair, they do have a territory that they do defend. And at some point, you do get a somewhat saturated environment. I don't know whether or not we're there yet or not, but oh, you're, they won't continue to grow exponentially forever. At some point, there'll be some kind of balance in the environment where you're going to have a population at whatever level that may be that will be relatively stable. It'll vary throughout the year based on the pups breeding activities and dispersal activities and those kinds of things. But at some point, uh, you know, I kind of want to get away from the idea that eventually you know, you're, you're going to have twice as many coyotes and then you have four times as many over time because there is some going to be some kind of environmental balance that it's bad now at the level it is now and we don't know how much worse it's going to get and i think it's going to get worse um if there's a meeting a year from now we may already at that time have a coyote human incident i I've, it just feels like it's coming um having been here 40 years and this was never on the radar and now it's on everybody's radar does I mean, it's my opinion I don't know what everybody else thinks and I, I think it would be good to start a grassroots thing and I'd be willing to try <laughs> I've been in talks with Nag's head about it and we'll do some more of that and I, I know some people who are extremely good at hunting coyotes or trapping them they're extremely good at it. They could make a very serious dent in the population. I, I guess the, the question would be, can that start now? Because the trapping season's in, and as long as there's mm -hmm. no local ordinance that Yeah, all, all of the, that, uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with all the regulations, so I have to go study that. And I mean, red tape as usual, but I know <coughs> you have to have it, but, um, that's my two cents worth. Well, I, Thank I you. Appreciate, I appreciate that. And I think what, what, you're, what you're actually doing is you're, you're taking the tools that are available and trying to come up with a way of applying those. And I think that's what's important is to come up with, with the way to overcome the challenges of small parcels. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of challenges here in, in an urban type setting that uh, you, you have to figure out a way to, to deal with in order to implement the, the mm -hmm. tools on an annual basis so that that's uh, yeah I, mean, I think that's that's where you're at it's so their county is unique in a lot of ways um but i think because of the enclosed nature of the area i, I think there are ways to work with if if we're allowed to do it but i think one one challenge that comes up is if, if how many I, I don't if you own one acre or you own 10 acres that's a that's a very small acreage, mm -hmm. but you can allow things on your acreage on, as long as local law allows it mm -hmm. that that may or may not be helpful to you. I think that's where the, the question is. You're you're looking at animals that use a thousand acres, mm -hmm. 
and they're very mobile that you, you may or may not be able to have any effect on, on very, very small acreages that are isolated. And I think that's, that's, that's part, of, part of the challenge is to figure out how to, how to put things together in a way that's meaningful. Is it ever possible to have people that really know how to go after these animals come supersede you know for a certain time period um, be able to to do what they do and um, that, that that's what they're here to do yeah the, I, I think part of part of the, the problem becomes that you can't give somebody permission mm -hmm. to trap on somebody else's property that that I think really becomes the the, uh, the base of the discussion mm -hmm. As far as if, if people are willing and able and, and able to do it legally, you know, under under local law, wherever it is, uh, then I think you would have the discussion about who, who would allow it in 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 a in a meaningful way. So that I, th I think a lot of challenges there, but I think that discussion you know certainly is is being had because uh, you're not not the first one that's this uh, seen that there there may be an issue when it comes down to your property. I know there is yeah. in our neighborhood. We have the Coyote Dining Room right beside us. Well, and they, you know, I, I think the cat, the cats that you own, certainly whatever you can do to to account for the presence of coyotes, that's in your best interest to, mm -hmm. to do that because that's your cats. The cats well, cats that, that yeah. are not as hard to, to yeah. do. Yeah. Oh, that. yeah. Of course. You know, it's, it's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Yes. Would you? I, just, yeah. I am afraid to walk my dog. I have a small poodle pug mix, and I live on Marlin Drive, and in the winter we're very isolated. Um, I've seen coyotes, I've counted up the number of times on our street in the last nine months, probably 12 times. And one morning in the daylight, I was stalked by a coyote with my dog on a leash. Um, I actually screamed for help, and Pat's husband came out. And so I've been driving to waterfront shops when the coffee shop opens at 7, so I can take my dog out. I've been going to the BP gas station at night because they're selling the convenience store because I am terrified to take my dog outside. So what would you recommend I carry just so I can walk my dog? I don't walk the boardwalk in the winter anymore. I mean, you know, they're just showing up. I've seen them in the church parking lot. Uh, one of my neighbor's cats was uh, consumed over Thanksgiving. Uh, the coyote had walked up two sets of stairs and taken off the step. Actually left the part of the name to the cat. So what do we do to protect our dogs? You say that the coyotes have an eye on the dog, but you know, what do I do to protect my dog so that and I, I, I think anybody who has those concerns needs to do what they feel like they need to do in order to, to, to deal with that part of it. You're, you're obviously doing what you feel like keeps you in a good yeah, position and safe. Fair. Well, <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll, Chris, Chris addressed it earlier. I'll, I'll try to address it again. Uh, the, generally, whenever there's an interaction with a, a human with a dog and a coyote, the coyote has one of two intentions. One is, is if it's a particularly small dog, it may be an interaction where it's actually interested in, in consuming or it looks at a, as, as a food item. The other is, uh, as Chris mentioned, it could be a territorial type interaction. There's pups around. It's trying to uh, defend a home range. It's trying to defend its territory. And there's another canid in it. And, and it may not have any intentions of, you, of that being a food type interaction. Uh, the best thing you can do is to try to divert the attention of the coyote from the pet, you know, holler, 
clap your hands, scream. Uh, you can carry a walking stick with you, beat it on the ground, those kinds of things. Uh, but basically, try to refocus the attention on the person. Generally, they're not interested in humans. There's never been a documented uh, incident where a coyote has uh, injured a human in an unprovoked attack. Uh, just try to make yourself as big, as bad as possible, and hopefully the coyote will go the other way, and then you also go in a different direction to try to avoid the interaction. The whole issue of the coyotes being present, you know, that kind of get back, gets back to the core issue we just discussed with the previous speaker. But really just try to do your best. It sounds like you're doing a good job. You're avoiding the areas where you're having those interactions and, and try to just divert the attention, make them refocus on you and go a different direction. At least 25% of our population, of our customer population, comes to the Outer Banks with their beloved animal companions. Dare County, <coughs> given the nature of our county and what we base our economy on, is in a different situation than any other counties, current I can bear, um, on in North Carolina that, that I'm aware of, or at least this strip. And, and as was uh, said earlier with Gail uh, Kowalski, there needs to be some very specific attention given to our very different situation here. Because I can tell you that our economy and the number of visitors that come to the Outer Banks with their animals to vacation and are unaware of this situation and are going to have a tragedy, that's going to lead this uh, discussion to a place that, you know, it could have been avoided if we can address it proactively as, as a county now. And I understand, I appreciate the education, but we have, you know, two whatever plus million people embarking on the outer base um, when these pups are, you know, making their migration. And, and we are in for, this has really become a serious issue in this county. And we're, and it has escalated, and we're about to move into our, you know, in the next few months, our tourist season, what this county is based on for the economy. And what a tragedy that would be. I would say that probably 50 to 70 percent of our rental homes in my neighborhood in Duck now cater to pets. Exactly. So that is really a concern, and there comes a point when you know you are the initial group, but there comes a point when we are we need some some real help in this situation. Um, I lost a cat that I was feeding because it's not a it doesn't have a home, um, and I understand. I mean, I've been educated tonight, but we have a, a population that is going to be embarking that is not educated and. And we need to do something a little different than Robin. Can I just comment on that? I, I um, am in the process of moving here from New York, Justice and County, above New York City. Every park you're going has signs saying beware of coyotes. People all over Westchester County are completely aware of coyotes. They're everywhere in Westchester County. There's more densely populated than New York. People know about coyotes. Saying that people are uneducated because they're coming from somewhere else is just wrong. They're not. They don't expect to experience it here. There are no signs saying that beware of coyotes. People are very aware of coyotes. Well, I, I, I think you bring up a really, a really good point that we, we've talked about awareness, and I've, I've seen some places that actually have tried to make people aware that way with signage. I think that's always that's always a good step, and some people avoid that because they really don't want to stir things up. But I I believe certainly there's there are circumstances that would say 
you know, this is a, it's a good thing for people to understand and to know uh, where, where, where they are and what they're, what they're doing, that, that you're, you're taking a step to make sure that people do understand I, I, it's it's a very uh, very challenging place. You you have a different uh, perspective than somebody who who just uh, just visits here because you own a business here. Does your business have acreage at Duck? I know it's in a public center, but it's in a center that is that they've been sited in very close yeah. to it. So. Could I just uh, ask, uh, you haven't directly addressed, but a lot of people have small dogs. So with the coyotes, uh, uh, I would think their inclination would be to pick up that dog. So, so if the coyote's looking at it as a food source, isn't that going to escalate the thing? Well, I, there's no perfect solution. And I, I think you're exactly right, the tendency would be to, to try and protect, right. but your, your safety is always first, certainly. Your safety of, of people around you and your, yourself. It would be, it would be a, a high level of safety. Certainly you have a right to protect yourself. Yeah, I, I think it's always, always a, good, a good question to ask local law enforcement about what, what uh, situations would apply certain techniques, what, what is available to people, for protection, what's not available? You know, I think in the end you have to do what what is protective of yourself. So I, I think that would always be a, a a question to ask local police departments as far as what what's feasible and what's lawful where you are, because there may be things that that would be okay that, that they could tell you that would be helpful to you. But I, I certainly wouldn't put myself at risk of of a, a, a confrontation directly. If, if I can help that. Yes. Hey, I've seen this uh, term used on the internet, and I'm just curious. Is there such thing as a coy wolf? There, there are, coyotes can hybridize with, with other canes, with dogs or wolves, or they, they can tie together that way. So certainly over time, I think most of what you see are, are coyotes. You know, I, I get people that have sent me <coughs> pictures of Coyotes, they say, are bigger than normal, and they say that it's a, a hybrid or something. So I don't the, know. Uh, with the red wolf population so close, uh, I understand it from some folks that some of these things have been high breed, high bred, you know, and uh, the term coy wolf has been thrown around the house. I ain't say it quite a bit. Um, but just wonder if the demeanor is the same as a coyote, if there is a hybrid form of this thing. Yeah, what what we're talking about tonight is coyotes. So I, you know, I, I think in the in the end, you, it's hard to say what's what exactly across the board. But you know, we're we're basically talking about coyotes as far as the coyote rules. Okay, well, yeah. uh, the fellow that was that had the information about the biology. Mm -hmm. uh, have you heard anything about these coy wolves, and is the demeanor the same as? Well, as, as Chris said, they do hybridize. They can hybridize with dogs, wild dogs, domestic dogs. They can hybridize with wolves. And they can hybridize with red wolves. Now, I really don't have any information on the behavior differences of hybrids versus non-hybrids or uh, whether or not you have hybrids here on the Outer Banks. I really don't have any information on that. Well, some of those that we've seen in the uh, Cleveland, that 37-acre uh, area, we check off. And uh, it's an open environmental area. And some of the, the coyotes that we've seen are quite large and bigger than the pictures up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a reddish color, not that that makes a difference. We hear that a lot. It could be that you're in a protected area and you've got a lot of adults that are allowed to get to older age classes and larger body sizes. We hear that across the whole state. That we've got huge well, coyotes. Yeah, I really, I don't recall ever seeing any research or have any information to, to show that they are different from a behavioral perspective one way or another. We had a question over here. She's been waiting. Um, I just wanted to know, I live on Harris Island, and I may be naive, we've had a couple coyotes come down. And it's really hard for me to believe that they're either going over the bottom or the bridge or the <coughs> So my feeling is 
Actually, they're coming down the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> Unless you're trying to catch a ferry, which might be another story. Anyway, um, so is that... Well, <clears throat> they, Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <clears throat> they, they're highly adaptable, they're highly mobile, and they go through, through extreme means to get to habitats to establish a home range and raise a family. And they've gotten here on the Outer Banks by running around the ends, going through shallow water, skipping over dry land. Uh, there is some connectivity on the extreme northern end, southern end. They swim. We've got coyotes that live on islands out in the middle of the sound. They do run bridges. There has been documented, not here in this, that I'm aware of in North Carolina, but they have been documented to run bridges. Uh, there may be dozens that didn't make it on the way here, but it only takes a couple to get here. And once you get a few mated pairs, you know, the population just continues to expand. Uh, and, and they're going to seek and utilize any habitats that are open or available to make a living in. And uh, uh, we have bears that swim out here to the Outer Banks, deer swim across the Sound. A lot of animals don't make it. And who knows the ones that when they hit the island and they hit the ocean and they keep trying to head east, who knows what happens to those animals. But, but it is totally realistic that they have gotten here by swimming and uh, skipping on shallow water or even swimming deep water, running around on the ends, making it on dry land and then just coming in through the ends. I mean, they're, they, they are so mobile, adaptable, and, and have the ability to get into about any habitat. Again, they're living on islands in the middle of the sound, and, and people didn't put them there. That's just where they ended up. Um, similar to the woman from Westchester, um, I, I, I came from New Jersey, and I was a wildlife rehabber for 10 years, and I also worked a hotline and uh, with coyotes um, as rehabber. The number one thing all of you guys can do is tell your friends and neighbors, don't feed anything outside, don't leave any food outside, because you will get not just raccoons, you'll get the coyotes, you'll get everything and their brother coming, because they don't know that that food's left out of your cat or your dog, and they don't care, it's a food source. So even if you clean up your yard, tell all of your neighbors, don't leave food outside, because it is an attractant, and they will come. And the other thing you can do through walking with pet, we, with our hotline, we just tried to have solutions under 20 bucks. In addition to a walking stick, you can wear a whistle around your neck. Mm -hmm. And that's really simple. And I don't know anybody that's ever been, you know, had a whistle around their neck and coyote continues to approach. You know, so it's really hard if you're not used to seeing wildlife and being around wildlife and wildlife has killed your cat. And I'm really sorry for that loss. But there are really cheap, easy, and safe ways to just blow a whistle and, and it will take off. And, and I know it might be scary to see if you're not used to it, but that coyote does not want to be around you. Mm -hmm. so. Those are excellent comments. Thank you. On that end, uh, I think we, we can take another, take another question. And I, I just want to make sure we've got some... Uh, some handouts to give you before you leave that, that cover some of the, the uh, contact resources that if you have issues, you, you can call me anytime. My number's on, on the paper. Uh, you know, more than glad to discuss specific issues. You know, we, there, there's an infinite number of things that can come up because we've got, we now have coyotes. So every situation is a little bit different, but we're always trying to come up with a, a a good way of, of dealing with the situation that is is productive for that situation. So uh, you mentioned a hotline. I'm going to pass out some cards as well. We actually now have a wildlife helpline in our Raleigh office that is available as a 1-800 number that when you call that number or you give it, if you have rental houses, if you're a realtor, this is a great resource to give people that, that may only be here for a short period but have an issue that comes up. Uh, that, that gives them somewhere to call to, to help give them a place to go in the right direction instead of having to come to you. 
uh, or having to go to, to somebody who may not understand what the options are in that, in that situation. Uh, so I, I want to make sure that, that we have that out to you before we go, uh, because I think that's very, very helpful information. Uh, plus, plus you, you can call me anytime. I think I've said that a couple of times. Uh, you know, more than glad to, to look at whatever we need to look at to, to address individual situations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just ask one last question. What agency in the county, in the state, is the one that provides those signs that educate the community that this is the, in existence? Is it your agency? I, I don't know of any signs that we provide. Well, but Westchester. I'm, I have seen signs provided, you know, by by parks, or I don't know who actually put the signs together, but uh, you yeah, know, certainly. Yeah, Gen generally, generally, when those types of signs are implemented, they're implemented by the property owners or by uh, local community leaders. They're built. You know, they're, a lot of them have their own sign shops. Uh, we can provide guidance on maybe what the verbiage should be on those types of signs. We do help communities with those kinds of things, but typically they're produced at the local level. Mm -hmm. Trapping outside the trapping season is is under a depredation permit. So that that is always something. If a situation comes up with an aggressive animal, uh, there's actually a permit that can be issued to uh, animal control officers to allow them to do to do work underneath that permit. But that that's on a case by case basis. Uh, when when it comes down to to trapping wildlife. It, it falls under those uh, wildlife laws that, that we've discussed. So that, that's always something that, that can come up if there's a situation with a sick or aggressive animal. Uh, then those, those are situations that we can assist uh, animal control in dealing with properly uh, through, through permitting. Chris, I think there's one more, one more back here. And, then, and I'm sure y'all will be around for a few uh -huh. minutes anyway. Yeah. So. Just so everybody understands, you know, he, he's just reiter reiterating that it's unlawful to trap foxes in Dare County. And if, you, if it was lawful to trap foxes, you might get more coyote harvest because more individuals would be on the landscape trapping. But, but that is not, that's not regulated by, by our agency. That, right, right. But, but his point was is that, it, it, is that you may get more trappers on the landscape and that would require a change through your county commission. That's not a law that our agency has the ability to regulate, just to make that clear. 
Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it. And I'm sure they'll be around for a few minutes if anybody else has any other questions. Thank you, uh, Evan, and thank you, yeah. Chris. Uh -huh.